Aside from the occasional dodgy tan line, the sun hasn't been much of a cause for concern for me in life thus far. So recently, when scientists started talking about the sun waking up, it caught my attention. What does it actually mean for the sun to be rising from its slumber? Has this happened before? And are we prepared for the consequences? Welcome to Brain Noises. I am Chloe, science enthusiast and recovering physicist. And on this channel, I talk about the thoughts that pass through my mind, sometimes relating to science, but I cannot make any promises. Quickly, before I get into it, Thank you to everyone who sent me kind messages over the past few months. Life's just, it's just got in the way. It's been a bit overwhelming and I haven't been able to make the content that I've been wanting to make. Uh, your messages have really meant a lot and thank you for your patience and just, yeah, looking out for me. What does waking up really mean? The waking up comment was made by Daniel Vasharan, Associate Professor of Space and Climate Physics at University College London, in response to the emergence of a new large coronal hole on the surface of the sun. This is a relatively common feature of the sun's outer atmosphere known as the corona. Geomagnetic storms can originate from coronal holes, but unlike those caused by CMEs or coronal mass ejections, their onset is pretty gradual and generally predictable. So already it's pretty clear that the sun has a lot of drama going on and there's a lot of stuff that sounds like it could potentially impact us earthlings, but it's not actually that surprising, and that's because the sun runs on a cycle. The sun runs on an approximate 11 year cycle that is determined by the flipping of its magnetic poles. Because the sun from North Pole to South Pole is actually a giant magnet, just a kind of massive complicated one. And these poles aren't stationary, they move about. Approximately every 11 years, the movement reaches an inflection point and the entire field flips. And so the North and the South Pole switch and after about 11 years, they switch back and so on and so forth. And in case you're wondering, yes, the Earth's poles actually do a similar thing. According to NASA, Earth has settled in the last 20 million years into a pattern of pole reversal about every 200,000 to 300,000 years, although it has been more than twice that long since the last reversal. A reversal happens over hundreds or thousands of years, and it's not exactly a clean backflip. Magnetic fields morph and push and pull at one another with multiple poles emerging at odd latitudes throughout the process. A very cool side note about the sun's cycle is that unlike Earth, it has been approximately 11 years long for 700 million years. And the reason we know this, that's possibly even cooler, is through examining rocks. Specifically, a team of scientists found that the thickness of rock layers and their chemical makeup changed over a period of 11 years. We don't, however, really know why it has stayed so constant, though some believe it could be shepherded by the alignments of Venus, Earth, and Jupiter. The articles are linked in the description if you want a little bit more detail on those things. Anyway, the key thing we're really looking out for when tracking the sun cycle is the size and number of sunspots, dark blotches that arise from strong magnetic activity on the sun's surface. Today, there are a few different methods and instruments that we use to track the sun cycle, but in reality, humans have been tracking the cycle through sunspots for thousands of years. And the invention of the telescope about 400 years ago only made this tracking more detailed. Even with this modern day array of techie ways to track the sun, individual surveying and drawing sunspots remains the main way that they're counted. Now, the general rule is that during a solar maximum, there are lots of sunspots and then very few during a solar minimum. And as more of these sunspots appear on the sun's surface during an active period, the likelihood of solar storms, bursts of electromagnetic energy that can hit Earth increases. This is because the magnetic field lines near sunspots often tangle, cross and reorganize, causing a sudden explosion of energy called a solar flare. Solar flares release a lot of radiation into space. If a solar flare is very intense, the radiation it releases can have wide ranging impacts for us, from the power grid, to satellites, to astronauts, to the internal navigation systems of animals. In fact, just last year, SpaceX lost up to 40 brand new Starlink satellites due to a minor geomagnetic storm, pushing them back into the Earth's atmosphere, burning them up it is thought that this incident alone cost the company $100 million, and that's just a minor storm. But as we know, these solar maximums occur roughly every 11 years, and so you'd think that if they were really that terrible, we would have heard more about them. 
So what's changed? Well, first of all, a powerful solar storm has actually hit Earth before, and it was kind of bad. In 1859, a solar storm sent enormous flares towards Earth in the first recorded event of its time. Telegraph systems across the Western world failed, with some reports of operators receiving shocks from the huge amounts of electrical current forced through the wires. Back then, there was not very much technology, so the damage was not very significant. But if it happened in the modern world, the damage could be trillions of dollars. A flare like that today could shut down all the power grids, all the computers, all the cooling systems on nuclear reactors. A lot of things could go bad. This is Avi Loeb at Harvard University. Loeb estimated around $10 trillion of damage to power grids, satellites and communications if one just as powerful hit today. And a flare just a bit stronger could even damage the ozone layer, which is famously important for, you know, frivolous things like the survival of the human race. And and the likelihood of this kind of event is actually kind of big, or at least more likely than I personally would like. It's been shown that a Carrington level event seems likely to occur in the next century, with a 12% chance of it happening in the next decade. So that all doesn't sound too great, but don't worry, there's more bad news on the way. <laughs> because our sun has been suspiciously quiet recently, and it's got a few scientists pretty worried. Timo Reinhold at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Germany and his colleagues compared measurements of this activity for 369 sun-like stars observed by the Kepler Space Telescope along with our sun. For as good a comparison as possible, the team ensured that these stars that they were surveying all have similar temperatures, chemical compositions, ages, sizes, and rotation periods. And yet, the researchers found that nearly all of these stars varied in brightness more than our sun. These stars are similar in every way we can measure to the sun, but many of them show variability up to five times higher than the sun which is surprising, says Reinhold. One possible conclusion would be that there is some yet unidentified quality of these stars that we don't know that is different from the sun. They are very much exploring other reasons, but unfortunately the fact that there are sun-like stars with much higher variability does suggest that it's possible that the sun is just as variable, i.e. we're currently in a calm period and it's gonna ramp up at some point in the future. Though apparently we can't predict when this will happen, so I guess we just gotta sit tight. So returning to our initial question, should we be worried and are we prepared? Well, the answer is kinda and kinda. From what I can see, it looks like we aren't actually very well prepared for a major solar storm and it also looks like one is coming relatively soon. But there are some advancements that could mitigate the damage and they lie in the prediction of these storms. Historically, predicting solar storms has been difficult because we don't know exactly how they're triggered. With telescopes, we're able to see a flare when it occurs, but that still only gives us eight minutes before the dangerous particles start to reach Earth, which risks satellite damage and the health of astronauts. Kanya Kasano and colleagues at the Institute for Space Earth Environmental Research in Japan believe they can help. Their Kappa scheme method can predict solar flares hours before in advance. They tested their method by looking at solar flare data between 2008 and 2019, and seven of the nine largest flares, so these are X-class flares, were predicted up to 24 hours ahead of time. So this would hypothetically give us a bit more time to reorganize satellites and astronauts. Previous methods of prediction relying on sunspot observation have had at most 50% success rates, says Cassano. The Kappa scheme instead relies on the strong magnetic fields associated with the solar flares. So let me tell you a little bit about how this method works. Before a flare begins, electrical currents flow along the sun's magnetic field lines. When two of these lines overlap, the lines reconnect, snapping together and releasing a huge amount of energy known as a solar flare. The team was able to predict when and where these reconnection events were likely to occur using magnetic and imaging data from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. The two flares that couldn't be predicted had reconnection events far above the solar surface. So they weren't in the viewing line of this instrument and that's why they were missed. These findings were published in July 2020, but we haven't quite got this method down for predicting future flares yet. In fact, just one month ago, we were hit by the most powerful solar storm in six years, and it caught us totally by surprise. So it's safe to say that we have a way to go before we can reliably predict these beasts. And so thank you for watching. As per usual, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. But before you go, 
hold on, because I want to leave you with a quote which I particularly enjoyed when researching this video because it can sort of be applied to pretty much all of the existential questions I ask on this channel. It's by Greg Laughlin, an astronomy professor at Yale, and he said, I'm not lying awake in bed at night worrying about solar superflares, but that doesn't mean that someone shouldn't be worrying about it. Okay, I'm really done now. Thank you for watching. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.